Job, Broken Images of God. And it has been quite the journey. And I don't know about you, but, you know, God is so prophetic because we're in this series about how we think God is. And we're in this series about a man whose life was just ripped up one side and down the other. He lost everything. And when I look around the world, it's such a, so many difficult things going on that I think it's just such an appropriate subject. And what we've discovered about Job is it really is more about how we as humans interpret God than it is about what's happening with Job. And that's why it's titled Broken Images of God, because we've, we see as we've been going through Job how many broken images that we have of God and how many ways that we view him are just not his personality, is just not who he is. And the way that we know that and can confirm that is because we look at Jesus and we look at the canonic, which is the self-emptying uh, personhood of who God is. God poured God's own self out for us as humans. Even though we were yet enemies, God died for us. And so we know that we view Job through the eyes of what Christ did. So when the author of Job is writing about these images of who God is, we look at the cross and we look at what God did at the cross and we go, that doesn't fit. It does not fit who God shows God's self to be on the cross. And really, when what Job shows us is that when all hell breaks loose in our life, what comes out is our theology of God. Do you want to know what you believe? Look at what you're thinking about when life is terrible. Do you want to know what you believe? Look at how you respond and what comes out of your mouth when life is difficult and life is terrible and everything feels like it's falling apart. And P.S., we all are there. We all do it. There's nobody that has attained. And what that is, is it's an opportunity when we see these things that come out of us and all of a sudden pour out, and when we've been pressed into a corner, all it is is an indicator. Doesn't mean we stink. Doesn't mean we have to carry shame. It just means we go, look at that. I need to go face to face with God and understand who he is in a deeper way. Because I can see that I'm not trusting right here. So the second thing that we learn is we all have broken images of God. And the miracle about Job's friends as they were speaking to him is they had both good theology and bad theology. So they had things that they were saying, well, obviously, Job, you have done evil in your life because bad things are happening to you. And if you were just doing good things in your life, then good things would be happening to you. And then they would go in and say something that was so profound about God. Like us, we carry within us good theology and bad theology. We carry both. There are times that we have the most prophetic, profound, beautiful thing that comes out of our mouth, and then the next instant we're like cursing God. We all do it. We all are in that same spot. What it means is we carry that, both sides, within us. And again, we don't carry with it shame. We just recognize it. And we go, there it is. It also creates a humility in us because we realize we do not know it all. And we realize we do not have a corner on the market of the truth, that only God does. We do not. We're human. And as we go along and we're looking and we recognize that we see God through Jesus, we recognize that we see God as Jesus, as the word of God became flesh and grew a beard. That even before anything scripture was written, we see Jesus. And as we're going on and we're recognizing this, we also learned that silence is better than speaking. <laughs> and we learned that Job's friends, when they really came alongside of him and helped him, it was when they stopped talking. But when they fell apart is when they opened their mouth. And I remember in my husband's house, Tony's house, his dad had this poster that was on the wall. And it had 
three birds on it, two of them with their mouths open to the sky and one of them silent. Do you remember this, Tony? Of course you do. It was your house. <laughs> so, and it said this, it is better to be thought the fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> I thought that was the best poster ever. And then I read it and it's in a proverb. It's in the Bible. And I was like, whoa, that's so prophetic. But Tony's dad had everybody's little names written on it. And he had, he had Chuck on one mouth. He had Frank on the other mouth. And Tony was the quiet mouth. That's right. And so when Job's friends opened their mouth and removed all doubt of their foolishness, and they felt that it was their duty to inform Job why this was happening. And not only did they feel that it was their duty to inform him, but they got ticked off when he didn't listen to them. They got angry because he didn't agree with their theology that he deserved punishment. And his argument was, I am innocent. I am innocent, and where is God? Have you ever felt like that? I this should not be happening to me. Where is God and why? Don't we all scream that out at times in our lives, going, why? Why is this happening? And again, their theology was bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people, and deep down in our hearts, we sometimes think that same thing. And we go, but I'm a good person, and why is this happening? And the reason it's happening is because we are on earth and we are in the between. We are between the now and the not yet. We are on an earth that's been fallen. We don't see, we see, we don't yet see all things subject to him, but we see Jesus. So we are on the in between. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Life appears to be unjust and it is. And the place where we have our hope is in Jesus. Somehow he brings that balance in to our life. So Job's friends have finished their dissertations and lectures and their pontifications and they've all been sitting behind the expert desk telling him what's wrong with his life. And Job has been continuously crying out, where are you? Why is this happening? But in the midst of it, he is screaming out, how do we connect? How do I connect with you? If only, if only you would come in front of me and have a conversation with me. If only you would talk to me. God, do you see me? Do you see what I'm going through in this moment? Do you see me? Do you even hear me? Do you even know me? Why is this happening to you? And do you care? Does it matter to you that I'm hurting? How many times have these same words come out of our mouths? How many times have we felt abandoned that God is not hearing us and that God is not helping? I think all of us. I know I certainly have. So enter in Elihu, who is the last one to speak. Now, here's what's funny about Elihu. Most commentaries like what he says. Most commentaries agree, don't agree, but they like what Elihu says. They're like, oh, Elihu comes on the scene, and because God doesn't say anything about Elihu but only rebukes the three, obviously what Elihu says is more important than what they said. I think Elihu is a jerk. I do. I read Elihu, and he's coming from this expert desk, and he, and he kind of rebukes everybody for what they're saying and goes, excuse me, guys, everybody step back. I have entered the room. Thank you, Sandy. That was so good. Beautiful. And he literally says to them, like, step back, guys. The one who knows is here. Let me speak. And he says the same thing that they said all along. And a lot of times the reason why commentaries think that Elihu um, is the one who really has it is because God doesn't rebuke him. But most commentaries and authors believe that Elihu came in at a later time, that he was added in. 
That's why God doesn't say anything to him. It's because his part of the book was added in. But again, here we go. Elihu, in the midst of his pontification and in the midst of his expert desk knowledge, all of a sudden stops in the middle and says, listen, listen to the thunder. He goes, the rolling, rumbling thunder of his voice. He lets loose his lightnings from horizon to horizon, lighting up the earth from pole to pole. In their wake, the thunder echoes his voice, powerful and majestic. He lets out all the stops. He holds nothing back. No one can mistake that voice. So Elihu is standing there, and he's talking to, to Job and the three friends. He's telling him, step aside. And he goes, wait a minute, listen. And there's a storm brewing, and he sees it. And he's telling them, here comes his voice. So in the moment of him saying something that was jerky, in that moment, he still can prophesy. And he still goes, look, there's God. And here comes the storm, and he's riding that storm. Hear me. In the midst of yuck, beauty can happen. In the midst of the best and the worst of us, we can at times say the most profound, beautiful, amazing things, and at other times say the worst, horrendous, terrible things. It's who we are. It's part of what makes us us, and God loves both sides. He still loves us, and he still believes in us, and he still hopes in us, and he still uses us, and he still says, I still want you to speak truth to people, even though you're kind of messed up yourself. <laughs> it's a beautiful gift that he has given us. So Elihu is talking, and then all of a sudden in Job 38.1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. How many people have storms in your life? And I want to pause here, and I want to talk about the storm. Because whether we feel it or not, whether we know it or not, God is in the midst of the storm with us. And it's in that storm most often that we feel the furthest away from God. It's when life is the darkest. It's when it's the most difficult. It's when we can't see. It's when our eyes can't see, our ears can't hear. When we feel the most depressed is when God is closest to us. It's when God is saying, I'm not moving anywhere. I am completely with you. But it's in those moments that we feel like Job, where are you? And you can't hear me. And I think about Jesus in the back of the boat. When he was in the back of that boat and the storm is roaring and, and the disciples are freaking out. Now, these are fishermen. They've been in storms before. And they are freaking out and they're screaming and they're throwing water out of the boat and they're, all, and they're watching Jesus. I'm sure they're looking at him like, what is he doing? He's sleeping. And he's sleeping in the back of the boat. Why? Because he's not afraid of storms. He's not afraid of our storms. He's not afraid of the things that we're going through. And it is often in these storms that we hear from God. It is often in these storms and in the darkness that it creates within us this need that we say, I have to hear from you, God. And we learn about God in a different way. And we see God in a different. Notice also that it says that God speaks to Job out of the eye of the storm. The eye of the storm, that place of rest and that place of peace. In every storm, there is a place of rest and a place of peace, and it is with God. In every storm, there is that place that if we can quiet ourselves down, and if we can go internal, and if we can rest and know that God is within us, and if we listen, in the worst moments of my life, when I hit that place, I have breath, I have life, and I know that it's going to be okay. And every time I hit the eye of the storm, God always answers the same thing to me. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. You will, you will be okay. I am here with you. doesn't mean my circumstances change one iota, but something shifts on the inside of me, and I go, I have longevity now. I can keep going in this difficult moment. The other thing about the eye of the storm is this. It's on the back end of the storm that the storm surge comes. It's on the back end of the storm that there are still things going on, but it's not as bad. 
And I remember one time that I had just gone through a difficult time, marriage, uh, we moved, it was just a whole bunch of stuff going on that was, that was terrible. And I remember the Lord saying to me, did it kill you? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And he goes, did you die from feeling the pain? I'm like, no. And he goes, exactly. And I heard him go, done. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> but there was another year of the residual. There was another year that the back end of the storm had to come to a rest. There was another year where circumstances and situations and choices that were made and all of these things that I had to live through and work through. So the storm was over. The front of the storm ended. I met God in the eye, but the storm surge came behind. That's the eye of the storm. So even though God says the storm is over, or even though you feel that there's a rest and a peace, there are still things, whether from choices, whether from circumstances that were done to us, whether from situations or, or whatever might be going on, there is sometimes still a surge that comes behind that we have to make choices that we will trust him even when the storm is past and we're getting the storm surge behind. God is in the storm. Life is fluid. There will be an end. Life keeps on moving. That's the beauty of the life of God, is God's presence and his life is forever blowing into every situation that we have, and life keeps moving. We don't get stuck, but we can get stuck internally. I'm reading this book. It is called Christ and Evolution. And what it talks about is that the evolution of life the evolution that you see in the life of ourselves, in the life of nature, is that in order for something to evolve, crises has to take place. That evolution occurs because of crises. That evolution occurs because something has happened, again, whether it's in nature or not, that creates this thing that says, I can't keep doing what I always did, because then I'll get what I always got. I have to change what I'm doing in order to survive. If we don't, then death ensues. And I'm not talking physical, I'm talking it could be death of relationship, it could be death of jobs, it could be death of, you know, whatever. Whatever it might be, it, death ensues, a.k.a. the dinosaur. So something happened, right? And then the dinosaur couldn't sustain and they died. So evolution creates this moment of crises where you either go and learn and change and go, I've got to change the way that I intersect with what I'm doing and find life. Or you go, I'm going to keep on doing what I've always done, and you start heading towards death. It goes one way or the other. So what do we do when these moments hit? Even Job had a change in his theology. Even Job in this moment had this evolutional change in his theology that he went, what I used to believe was bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people. He had that same theology. It's no longer working. What I believed about God is no longer working. So part of the cry of his heart is, okay, what I have is no longer working, so who are you? How do I know you? How do I connect with you? And the things that I always put stock in and thought would work are no longer working. So when we hit those moments in our life where life is no longer working, that is an evolutional change to go, I got to find a different way. I got to change what I'm doing so I can find a different life. We all did it. You know, you all know the year I had. I had to find a different way of doing life because I knew that somewhere, even in the midst of a mom and dad who both died, in the midst of accidents and difficulties, in the midst of all of those things, I knew that God was there and I knew that his joy was present and I knew there was a different way to walk and it changed my life. It changed the way I see. It changed the way I listen. Actually, it started four years ago, that change. It changed everything within me because I went, okay, the way that I once knew you isn't working anymore. The way that I once knew you isn't the way that I know you now. I got to find a different way. And he said, come on. 
If your faith is the same faith that you had when you first got saved and when you first came to know Jesus, it, you're stuck. We need to grow and we need to change and we need to find God with different eyes. Our faith also has to evolve. Constantly it has to evolve. So God speaks into this moment. He speaks into this storm. When, when people read this chapter and they start to, to read what God says to Job, there's a couple of ways to read it and to hear it, but most people hear it like this. Christine, could you put that on? Not that. okay we'll wait doing great come forward tell me when it's over look at that look at that <laughs> I want to go home. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? Who are you? If you please, I am Dorothy, the small and meek. We've come to ask you. All right, that's good. That's how we see God, is that we're coming to him and he's going, I am the great and powerful, you little small person. That's how we see God in our heads. And when we read this part of Job, it says more about us than it does about God. Because we all hear that tone of voice where he goes, who is this that darkens my counsel? This is how we hear it. Who is this that darkens my counsel like Oz? With words without knowledge. Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you and you shall answer me. Come look at your face, Sandy. Come stand before me. That's it. Wait, wait, wait. Do it again. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. <laughs> that was the most fun I've ever had. <laughs> if only I could wear that and do that all the time. Time. Wow, that was awesome. So good. Anyway, that was just too fun for me. I've lost my train of thought. Totally. But that is how we hear it. We hear God standing and screaming at Job. But he's talking to him like a father. And he's looking at him and he's saying, wait a minute, who is this that darkens my counsel? Now, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is a very picturesque uh, language. When we look at it, we go, who is it that darkens my counsel? But there's always this dimension in the Hebrew. So when God is actually speaking to Job, he's not going, who is this that darkens my counsel? He's actually saying to him, He's saying the, Greek, the, the Hebrew here for um, the darkness. Hang on, because i got to find it here. It's like God is saying this. Who is saying that dark is dark 
and that there is no light in it whatsoever. He's going, who is saying that when you are in the dark, that I am not there with you, that my counsel is not there with you? Who is saying that darkness is so dark that I am not a part of that darkness? That's what he's saying to Job. He's not saying like, what, what human ant is darkening my counsel? Job is probably the, the uh, most profound book when it comes to darkness. Over three dozen times, Job is talking about darkness. So there is this play on words that Job has about darkness. Because when he's screaming about darkness, he's screaming, there is absolute darkness. There is nothing in the darkness at all. God is not here. And God is saying, who is it that says that when you're walking in darkness, that my light is not there? Who is it that is saying this about my counsel and about me? That's the nuanced words within the Hebrew. So God is looking at him and going, you're looking at, at it in human terms. You don't know, you don't understand, and there is no such thing as total darkness. And he's saying to him, why do you confuse the darkness? When we are in darkness, we are never, never without God. And God says in the Psalms that darkness is as light to him. There is always light. It is the lie of the enemy that tells us you're in a place that God can't touch you. That is a lie. We are never away from God. We are never away from God's presence. We are never away from his breath and his life. It is always within us. And then God says to him, brace yourself like a man. And what that, and he says, and I'm going to question you and you shall answer me. This is what this word means. He's saying, gird your loins like a man, which means tuck your outer robe-like garment into your sash belt as a man does before taking on a strenuous task, such as running or fighting. So he's going, we're going to talk man to man. Gird up. He's saying, tuck, tuck your little toga into your belt because we're about to do some work, you and me, Job. We're about to have a conversation, so come on. He's not yelling at him. He is going, we're going to talk. We're going to talk face to face. If you're a parent, there have been times in your life where you've had to sit down with your child and look him in the eye and go, hello, welcome to the world, and we're going to have a conversation. And you got, that's what God is doing. He's looking at Job going, hi. You think that in your darkness there's no light. You're wrong. And we're going to do some work together. So I want you to tuck your toga in and let's start working because we're about to go in and I'm going to talk to you. And then he begins to talk with him about creation. Excuse me. My life is a mess and you're going to talk to me about creation. Really, God? So... Really? How many times do we ask the wrong questions? How many times do we go to God and go, here's the issue, this is what's wrong, here's the problem, and God goes, you're not even in the ballpark of the question that you need to ask. How many of us have gone to God and he answers us in a completely different way, and yet it is the answer? And it is exactly what we needed, and we're like, really? that was it. How many times have I been looking this way, going, this is it, and God takes my little face and goes, no, this is it. And I'm like, wow, this is it. That is amazing. So God begins to talk about creation. And when I am reading this, I read it as God laughing and enjoying his creation. And he's like he's looking at him going, wait, were you here when I made the animals? Were you with me when I did this? Do you know Leviathan, the dinosaur that swims in the deep like I do? He goes, come on, tell me, tell me if you can, do you know this? When I'm reading this, I read a joyous God who is 
embracing his creation. And here's, here's the clincher for me. Before scripture ever was, Romans 1 tells us that God's creation cries forth his glory. He is saying to him, do you want to know me, Job? Look at what I've made. And that's why he goes to creation. And he's saying, if you know creation, you're going to know me. If you look around you at the skies and the trees and the beauty of creation, you know me. Do you want to know my love? Look at a butterfly. Do you want to know how I move? I ride the storm. Do you want to know how I love? Look at the love between humans. Look at the love between a parent and a child. That's who I am, Job. I never understood why he went to creation. And he says to him, do you know where darkness and light reside? I do. He says, if I could find it. He said, can you contain the constellations? I can. He reveals himself as mighty as a tornado and as gentle as a butterfly. God carries both within God's own self. He reveals himself as a tiny seahorse alongside the mighty stallion. Both carry his essence. The reason I get choked up because it's, it's mind-boggling beautiful. All we have to do is look at a tree. All we have to do is look at a bee, and God goes, I'm a part of that because that came out of me. I don't care if you think of the Big Bang or if you believe in the creation. It doesn't even matter because every scientist says there's got to be a higher power, and that is God. And he said, do you want to know me? Look in my creation. Romans 1. You look at him in the gorilla alongside the tiny monkey. What is that? Okay, look at that little thing. See, both, both embody who God is. Both embody the personality and the beauty of God. Do you want to see God's sense of humor? Look at that little thing on the left. Do you want to see God's power and what he can do? Look at that gorilla. See, both came out of his creativeness and his beauty. The whale and a minnow. Wait till you see this one. Both. The whale and that teeny, tiny little what is that thing. But God knows when that tiny little thing leaves this earth. He said, there's not a sparrow that dies that I don't know it. See that little thing right there? I know when, I know that, I know that thing. Breathe that in. Show the last slide. Oh, the hummingbird and the eagle. The tiny little hummingbird that's the size of a bumblebee. Yet that's a bird. It's not a bee, it's a bird. And the eagle. Go to one more slide. Look at the wave and the desert and the little soft bunny, and Niagara Falls, and flowers. And take those in and meditate, because those came out of God. And he's looking at Job, and he goes, do you want to know me, son? Do you want to know about light, and about life, and about beauty, and about love? Do you want to know these things, son? He's looking at Job. He goes, look at my nature around you. That's me. I created this. Not only did I create it, but I created it for you. I created it because I love you. And I created all of these things that we could enjoy them together. That's who God is. That's why God said, 
let me show you nature because nature is who I am. I believe that he is, as you read these, 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 this text, 38 through 40, 41, I just think God is laughing and enjoying, and I think we have gotten so caught in the drudgery of life, so caught in getting up in the morning, going to work, paying the man, doing this, doing that, that we forget to stop and look at a tree and go, wait a minute, there you are. And nature also cries forth the rhythm of life. We have deaths in our life. We have winters of our lives. We have springs of our lives. And we have summers of our lives. And even there, God says, don't be afraid of the winter and don't be afraid of the deaths because you will have spring. Hang in there. Find me in the midst of it, no matter if you're in summer, spring, winter, fall. doesn't matter. Find me in the midst because I can be found. And find me in what I say about nature. But we are so trained for the negative. We are so trained to view the, to, to view the, the dark side. Hello. <laughs> Hello, that's me. Hello. But it is in these last four years that I have been working and, and breathing in God's presence, not only through Scripture, not only through one another, but through his nature and going, this is you too. So that when life feels overwhelming or it feels hard, if I just see that rainbow or I just see that dove or I just look at the tiny minnow, or I just see a hummingbird, I go, you're there too. This all came out of you. You have not left us. You have not forsaken us, but you are a part of that too. And I believe that God is screaming at Job in the gentle way, not the mean way, but he's going, renew your mind to find my life. Renew your mind to see me even in the dark. Renew your mind that when you're feeling like you're alone, to take a look at a bird flying across the sky or take a look at a flower or, or take a look at something that cries forth who God is. I believe that God is forever screaming this out to us, but we are trained to the negative. We are trained to see the yuck. We are trained to see the darkness. We are trained to see the pain. And all you got to do is turn the television on and watch news and it's there. Sometimes all you got to do is turn to a person and you have a little complaining fest that goes on. Come on. We're all there. We're all there. We all do it. But he's inviting Job to see. He's going, Job, welcome to the bigger picture. Welcome to the picture that is bigger than you. Welcome to the picture of who I am. Embrace the fullness of me. I believe, and, and you all know this, this is what it means by you know them by their fruit. We know God by what he created. We know God by what we see. And that's why he said, no one is without excuse for knowing me because all you have to do is look around. All you have to do is breathe that in. So here is my charge. Well, first let me say this. It says this, when Richard Rohr, when God himself in this great dramatic presentation, refuses to give us answers and calls us instead into communion, that is the answer. And that's what he's calling Job to. He never answers him. And next week we'll hear this, but I'm going to say it now, and you all know the story probably. After God gets done with presenting nature, presenting who he is through nature. And it was through weather, through animals, through you name it, everything that was created. Job goes, I repent. I know nothing. Doesn't matter. I, you're right. I repent. It took a face-to-face -face encounter. And you all know the story of a time in my life that God met me in a face-to-face. -face. And this has happened two profound times in my life in regards to healing of my family of origin. One was with my dad, and one was with my mother, and my whole life, because my whole life felt like it was cursed. My whole life felt like it was terrible. My whole life. And one moment with God, when love filled my heart, suddenly nothing mattered. Nothing that happened to me, nothing that was going into the future, I knew that his love was enough. 
Love covers over a multitude of sin. Love covers over a multitude of yuck. Somehow, love is enough. That's why we believe in loving fearlessly here at Cornerstone, because love is enough to cover over everything. Everything. So when Job goes face to face, he goes, you're right, I'm wrong. And you know, in that moment with me, I wanted my mom and dad to pay me back what they owed me from what they stole in my life. And I thought I was going to extract it out of them through treating them not nice, through bitterness, through anger. And then I would have good days where I'd be like, in the name of Jesus, I forgive them. In the name of Jesus, I forgive them. Anybody? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then 12 minutes later, I'd see my mom and want to be like, anybody? But in that moment, I just went, didn't matter. Didn't matter. Suddenly, it didn't matter. Suddenly, I knew that his love was enough to heal me. I knew they could never pay me back, but I knew his love was enough to heal me. And, and it healed me through and through, through and through in such a beautiful way. Find him. Find God. Find God in no matter what the circumstances that we're facing. Find him. So here is my charge for the week. Find and discover who God is. Not through me. Not through anybody. Yourself. Find his face. Find his face in every situation and circumstance. Sit before him. Read God's word. Challenge God's word. But even more than that, go take a seat in nature and stare at grass, a flower, a bird. Think about your favorite animal, whatever it is, and find him there. Find him out of the box. Find him out of the religious box. Find God's breath. God gave me an epiphany about six weeks ago about his breath. I hate wind. I used to hate wind so much. Be <laughs> One time, I made Tony drive to church with the windows up when we first got married because the wind was messing my hair. And that man did it. And we had no air conditioning, by the way. He's a good man. I'm sorry, honey. You're such a good man. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, the wind. So I had this epiphany about wind because it's a long story. I'm not going to go into theology behind it, but wind as God's breath. And I discovered that wind never goes away. It just moves. So like wind never stops. It just moves. I didn't know that. I thought wind died. It doesn't. It just goes on to another place. So the, the wind is constantly flowing around the earth. It just matters where it comes and where it is. I didn't know this. I thought wind like that, like it left, but it doesn't. So that got me thinking. Look, I'm going into it anyway. So it got me thinking about the breath of God. And it got me thinking about the Ruach of God, that when God breathed existence, right? When God breathed this world into being, what was it? And when God breathed into us, and I thought, wow, so the wind and the breath, and it talks about the Holy Spirit being as wind. And it talks about how God is as wind. And it talks about God riding the clouds. And I'm thinking about all this, and I began to think about wind. And so now, when it, when it wind blows, I'm like... Oh, come on, give me your breath. There it is. It's just a little epiphany that brings me into a different place with God that now instead of running from the wind for fear, <laughs> instead I run into it. And one hair might go out of place, one hair. But I run into it and I just go, okay, breathe your breath, Lord. Breathe your breath. I'm talking about that kind of out of the box. And I do believe in the depths of my soul, that as we stand in the wind, it is God going, I am here. Even here, I rest. So my charge is find him. No matter what is going on, no matter where you are, find him.
find his breath, find his life, find God out of the box, go sit in nature, breathe in, watch a tree, find God there. Amen? Amen. Amen. can move that. So if you need prayer or anything after the service, I'm going to have the elders come up. If you need God's breath, if you need to find God, I invite you to come up and let us pray with you and let us pray over you. You know what? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Dave, where are you? Come on up. It's a little early. I'm going to take the time. I'm such a firm believer in movement, and I'm a firm believer that in the altar, first off, and coming forward, and second off, in us moving our bodies and going into agreement with God, there's something powerful about stepping out and saying yes. I don't know what it is, don't profess to know, but there's something powerful. And I know even for me to step out and to go, that's me, God. I want that. So I want to open the altar up. A, if you need new things, if you need change, if you need to switch up the way you're doing things, I invite you to the altar to lay down the old pattern and to go, Lord, I lay this down, and I need something new. And I thank you, you're about creation and creating, and I need that new in my life. The second thing, if you need to find God in the situation that you're in, it's just a move forward to say, Lord, I'm going to look for you, and I'm going to find you, and I'm going to quiet myself, and I'm not going to talk, but I'm just going to listen. And I'm going to listen for your voice. So as we... As Dave plays, I'm going to invite you to come up. We'll just do this for a few minutes. The altar is open. Come on forward.
stand for the benediction. If you're up at the altar, just stay there. It's okay. They're going to keep playing. We have prayer cards that are underneath each seat. And if you have a prayer request, fill it out. And there's a group that comes in on Tuesday nights to pray at 6 o'clock. And we pray over the cards. And uh, we invite you to join us, 7 o'clock prayer. You can come at 6 o'clock to pray over the cards. Wednesday night is our community dinner along with our uh, recovery meeting. You're invited to come to that as well. And Tuesday night is also our pure praise and worship night. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your creation cries out your glory, your creativity, your beauty, your love. We thank you that you love us. 